Good morning, Olive Branch. It's going to be a good day today. <laughs> if everybody will please stand, we're going to make some joyful noise with joy to the world. Sorry about my kids following me. Good thing they're cute. All right. Well, we welcome you to Olive Branch this morning. We are glad that you are here. Um, today, I would like to start with a reading from Ni Ninemiah 8.10. Am I going to have to hold her? Huh? She good? Yeah. All right. So Nehemiah says this, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What a wonderful reminder this morning. Hadley's missing some joy this morning. <laughs> um, so we start today with a few announcements and prayer concerns. Um, first of all, the life jacket drive continues to go on. It's in the back of the church um, in the foyer. We have a good amount of life jackets, but we're looking for some more adult life jackets. Our goal is to get 20, and we will be donating those to the church camp. Um, the end date for that is September 11th. If you have a gently used life jacket or if there's some on sale that you buy, please feel free to share them and put them in the back foyer. Also, the 175th celebration of Olive Branch Baptist Church is on September 18th. We have all kinds of fun stuff planned for that day, so we encourage you to invite your family and friends, and let's just have a great day. Um, today, we do have business meeting after church, if you would like to attend that. The Faith Over Fear 5K is September 3rd at the Ogle Park. There's no registration fee, but we would love to have a great church turnout. Um, so if you have any questions, you can follow up with Ginger. Um, do you have, what time? 10? 10 o'clock. So we'd love to have everybody there and walk together. Um, also, as many of you know, Jill Cooley did pass away this week, um, and so her funeral is Saturday. We are supplying the meal for that, so if you would like to donate sides that go with chicken um, or desserts, that will be, the funeral itself will be in Little Church, um, but we're also supplying the, the dinner. Uh, Thelma is coordinating that, so if you need Thelma's numbers or you have questions, Rinzi is here today, or you can also ask myself. Okay, so for those of you who didn't hear that, this building will be open on Friday for the visitation. And so if you wanna drop any food or desserts off, this building will be open for that just to get everything coordinated. Also, we do have a praise for today. A couple of weeks ago, we started to um, gather supplies for the flood victims in Eastern Kentucky. And so those were donated to the Mick Robertson Community Center and they were very thankful for them. So thank you for everyone who donated to that. I also wanted to share this scripture with you to, this morning, and it comes from Romans 12, 12, where it's scripture says this, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. 
I wanted to share that this morning because I know every week we go over this prayer list, um, and these are names that are not just names on a list, but they are names that we are intentional in praying for. Um, And God wants to hear our prayers. He knows the cries of our hearts, but he also wants to hear us speak them to him, which is one of the reasons why we have a prayer list. So as I said, Jill passed away this week. We do want to pray for Roger um, and Vicki. Jill was such a staple in this church too, so we also want to be in prayer for our church family. Um, Jill left a great mark of resiliency, and so we are just thankful for the gift that she is and was. Also, we wanted to add Marsha Bowling this week. Um, She had some test results. She happens to be at a family reunion this week, but we want to pray for Marsha. We want to pray for Jane Myers. This is Becky Curlin's mom. She had a stroke. We added Sherry Wiseman. She broke a bone in her shoulder, so we pray for healing. Jordan Bledsoe has left for a year-long treatment program, so we want to be in prayer for Jordan and his family. We have a lot of ongoing concerns. Um, Jerry Chatham has cancer. Lewis Kelly also is battling cancer, along with Sam Copeland and Natalie Dickerson, so we want to be in prayer for those four. We added Amberly King, who is in a rehab after a stroke. We pray for Dan Morgan. He's in need of a kidney transplant for kidney failure. Mary Lou Curlin um, is in the nursing home at Swiss Villa, so we just pray for peace for her. And then Randy Dickerson has been battling a lot of general health concerns, so we want to continue to pray for him. Are there any um, updates on anybody on our list or any praises or new prayer concerns you would like to add today? Did I say Morgan? Mangold? It's Dan Mangold, right? No, I might have. I don't know. Y'all, we were up real late last night. That back to school bash got crazy. Like God was like, we're going to open the floodgates and you're going to have to have 12 to like 25 kids in Mike and Marla's house and figure this out. So at one point they were like counting lightning strikes to like act like God was bowling. I don't know. It was a thing. Um, And then at one point a bubble soccer was like flying away and I'm like looking outside and I'm like, I don't see any bubbles. And then here comes Case and Haskell, like something out of a scary movie. He just like emerges from rain and fog. This is a true story. And he's like, go back. We lost it. It's gone. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening, but you cannot make up all of Branch Youth Group stories. So it was a great time. We appreciate everyone who came out and just made a great, great time out of such a crazy day. But anyways... (laughs) All right, my friends, why don't you go ahead and pray with me? So God, I just thank you that we can gather here together to share stories where we just got together and praised you and had a good time. We pray for each name that is on our prayer list. Uh, We specifically lift up Roger and Vicki this week um, as they're just dealing with loss. We just pray for the people that are new on our prayer list. We ask that you be with Marsha, Jane, Sherry, and Jordan. We also pray for those on our prayer list that have been there for a while, for the people who are battling cancer, Um, for those who are sick or maybe they suffered a stroke or in need of a kidney transplant. Lord, whatever this list is, we know that you are good. We know that you hear the cries of their hearts and our hearts, but we also know that you answer unspoken prayer requests, Lord, that that you are present with us, that your Holy Spirit is here in this place. We just ask that what we say and what we do would be for your glory, Lord, that you would cleanse our hearts so that we can hear what you have to say to us. We love you and we thank you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
and for the sake of all mankind. Salvation is in His blood. Jesus Messiah, the righteous died for love. David, would you please pray for us? We did want to announce uh, our folks down the street uh, at St. Our brothers down the street at St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Uh, they're having their ice cream social on September the fourth. Um, seven flavors of ice cream, all homemade: pies, cakes, barbecue, hot dogs, and drinks. Free will offering, and it starts at four o'clock. So, um, I want to go down and support those folks um, on September the fourth, beginning at four o'clock. Um, we had our fire inspection this week. Um, once a year, they come and test all the alarms and things like that. And what, Renzi, 9 o'clock Tuesday morning? Uh, Renzi was going to meet him out here, and the guy called me and he goes, I'm here, I'm here at your church, so there's nobody here. I'm like, 
well, hang on. So I called and I got Thelma and she said, well, he left half an hour ago. So, uh, so I called the guy back and I'm like, well, you know, he should be there. Well, he's not here. And I said, well, something's held him up. He'll be there in a minute. Well, I'm on the side. Of, is there another parking lot? And I'm like, well, there's one across the street, but you should be able to see it. And well, I'm on the side, I'm on the side where there's all, I'm on the side of the church where there's all the, uh, uh, handicapped parking. I went, is that church brick? And he goes, yeah. And I go, you're at the wrong church. And, um, if you put our address into a GPS, it will take you to St. Peter's down the road. I, I think they did that on purpose, but, uh, so I assume he got here, didn't he, Rans? Um, but, uh, uh, question before we get to the other questions this morning. Um, who thought it was weird that we sang Joy to the World? <laughs> um, it's a traditional Christmas song, obviously, uh, and we sang that as part of our call to worship today. Um, and if you thought it was weird, you're not alone. Uh, I told Jenny before she left uh, to go over and sit by Kevin, I said, uh, we're about to really confuse people this morning. Um, but Joy to the World was not written as a Christmas carol. If you look at it, there is no reference to Christmas. Um, it was written as a hymn of praise. Um, so we sang it today uh, because it fits into this morning's message. It, like I said, it's traditionally, we have made it a Christmas carol, but if you look at the words, um, it's not, it wasn't written uh, to celebrate Christmas. It was written to celebrate God. So, um, with that, uh, we're going to start again this morning uh, with, uh, with a question, uh, two of them actually. Um, the first question is, what makes you happy? Right? When I ask you to think about things that make you happy, uh, different things run through people's minds. Hopefully, uh, there are several things that come to your mind, right, about things that make you happy. Um, so as you think about those things, the second question is, and you may have already gotten there, is what brings you joy? Um, what brings you joy? Um, for most people, our, our, our first thought is that, that those two words, happy and joy, uh, are interchangeable, right? Because there are so many times when we use them as though they were the same word. Um, when I asked the two questions this morning, I'm guessing that that all of those things that came to mind when I asked you about your happiness, they repeated in your mind when I asked you what you thought about your joy. Um, you know, a, a good example is that, is, do your children bring you joy, if you're parents? Uh, do your children bring you joy? The answer to that is probably yes, uh, but did they always make you happy? <laughs> the answer to that is probably not yes, right? Um, there are things that that make us happy and don't make us happy, but, but in the grand scheme of things, they will bring us joy. And I, I think our kids are a good example of that. But um, so for some of you, um, there's, there's a difference that you've heard preachers use before, and, and, and we're going to talk about it just for a second, and then we're going to move on. But happiness, being happy, um, is more of a fleeting emotion. Uh, you can be happy one moment and sad the next. Um, being happy sometimes in the grand scheme of things is, is a temporary thing. Um, I can be happy and something happens and all of a sudden I'm not happy anymore. But, but for joy, there, there's kind of a difference, isn't there? The, the joy that you have inside of you just isn't in your mind, but it's primarily found in your heart. Um, because you can have joy even when you're not happy. And all of that is going to lead us to another question in a moment we'll get to. But, but the first, I, I want to look at our focal scripture this morning. It's, it's found in the letter, of Ro letter to the Romans. Uh, Paul writes this letter to the early church in Rome. Um, and we're in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. If you have your Bibles, you can turn over there. If you don't, uh, it should be, the scriptures will be up on the screens. But uh, Paul writes this in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So ends the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather here. And Father, I would just ask that in all things you would be glorified. We're, 
we're blessed and honored by your presence with us in this room. And we just ask that not only do we hold you up as, as, as our Lord inside this building, but also when we go out into this world. Father, I ask that you would bless each and every person in this room today. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. So, joy and happiness. And I think one of the great misconceptions about having faith, being a, being a Christian, is, is that giving our problems to God, accepting God, accepting God through his son, one, one of the, the misconceptions in that is when we give our lives to God, that immediately eliminates all of our problems. Right? People think that a relationship with God is all rainbows and candy bars. And, and I believe that sometimes we as Christians unintentionally, unintentionally lead people in that direction. You're never going to beat this addiction without God in your life. You can't fix your relationship with your spouse without God in your life. You can't get out of the financial mess you're in without God in your life. Now listen, all, all three of those statements and, and others like them, they are true, okay? They're true, but they can also lead people to a mistake in their thinking. Because while it's true that none of those things can be overcome without God in their life, we can't race to the conclusion that God will fix everything in their life immediately. Once you ask God into your life, your addiction, your addiction battle is going to immediately disappear forever. Once you ask God into your life, you're never going to have a disagreement or a fight with your spouse again forever. Once you ask God into your life, all of your debt is going to just disappear into thin air. And you're going to have this bank account filled with money. I mean, those statements are silly, right? I mean, we, we think about that. and Those are kind of silly, but, but for people who are struggling in the midst of some controversy or some crisis, if we're not careful, that's the message they hear. And that can lead new believers to become frustrated and confused to the point that very quickly they choose to walk away. Well, that didn't work. So let's try something else. But that's when, as Christians, we need to talk to people about a relationship with God through Jesus, bringing joy into their life, not just happiness. Because we can have joy even when we're not happy, right? In fact, I believe that we are at our best as evangelists, as people reaching out and trying to share Christ with other people. I believe we are at our best as evangelists when people see us continue to have joy even when things aren't going well. When we continue to have joy even though we're not happy. You know, we talk in here a lot about the fact that people are watching you. They're, they're watching to see what's different about you than everyone else. And, and they're expecting to watch your reaction when things don't go your way. How do you react when things aren't going well in your life? In John, Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 22, Jesus tells his, his disciples, So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. See, Jesus saw their grief. He, he saw their unhappiness. But he said, hold strong, because even in your unhappiness, I'm going to come back. And you're going to rejoice. And the joy that you have and the joy you expect, no one can take away from you. 
in James, the letter in, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever we face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Here again, even when, James says, even when we face trials and tribulations, when, we, when things don't go right in our life, we should consider that joy. Because it's maturing us and it's maturing our faith. But we can read all of those verses and we can consider them from a position that allows us to ponder them at length, right? We can stand outside and we can see these verses. But what about those people who aren't as lucky? What about those people who are in the midst of the chaos when we start reading them those verses? Pat, my life's a mess. Well, you should consider it pure joy, right? Again, we can't allow people to confuse happiness with joy. Because when they do, and when we do, they're more apt to expect a quick, a quick fix to their problem. And when that doesn't come, they walk away. Well, why would they do that? Well, they do it because they are not finding joy in God. They are attempting to find joy in what God is doing for them. See the difference? They're not finding joy in God. But they're attempting to find that joy in what God is doing for them and what God is going to do for them. God, if you fix this problem, I will have joy in my life. Right? It's not, God, I have joy in my life through you even when I, have, when I hit the valleys. Their joy is found in what God is, what they expect God to do for them, not what, not in God Himself. And that brings me to our next question today. For you, is your joy in God, or is your joy in what God is doing for you? Right now, things are going great. Thank you, God. Things are going great. See, we fall into that trap too. We think God is close to us when things are going really well. And when we have problems, we feel like God walked away from us. And the problem in that is where God comes in in relationship, or where God comes in in relation to where we come in to a situation. When we hit those low points, is our natural tendency to turn that over to God or is our natural tendency to turn that over to ourselves, right? You don't have to raise your hand. I already know the answer because I have the same answer you do. Things begin to fall apart. Things begin to go wrong. And my tendency as a human being is to step back and go, I can fix this. And somewhere God's going, no, you can't. Because when we allow God to be central in our lives on a daily basis, the cornerstone of our life on a daily basis, finding joy in that is knowing that God is with us in the good times and in the bad times. Again, joy is found in your heart. It's not subject to the ups and downs of the daily life of your daily life that goes on in your mind. God, I don't understand why I'm in the situation that I'm finding myself in. But I trust that you do. And I'm going to place my joy in the fact that you are in control of what's going on. 
And I'm going to place my faith in you and my joy in you and in good times and in bad times because I am placing you first and me second. But for others, it doesn't go that way. For others, it's, God, I was in a mess, and even though I wasn't sure about all this religion stuff, I thought it was worth a shot. And I was desperate. And God, it's been a couple of weeks, and I'm still in the same situation. I'm still miserable. I still feel like there's no hope. So obviously, you either can't help me, or you don't care enough to help me. So I'm going to move on to something else. And family, as weird as that sounds, that happens in people's lives every day. So can you see the difference there? See, the difference comes down to where we place our joy. Because we either place it in God through Jesus... Or we place it in what God is doing for us at the moment. Or what we expect God to keep doing for us. God, as long as you keep doing what I want you to do, then I'm going to have joy in you. Back to Romans. Chapter 14, verses 17 through 20. Romans 14, 17, to, 17 through 20 says... For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this, in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. Now here in these verses, Paul's talking about people basing their relationship with God on physical things. In this case, food. God, I'm happy with you because you're feeding me, right? In this case... He's looking at people having the ability and having the things to eat and drink and having their physical needs met. And they're basing their relationship on God with having their physical needs met, not necessarily their spiritual ones. Instead, the kingdom of God, Paul says, is about the process of each of us becoming righteous Righteous is becoming more Christ-like, more like Jesus. It's about each of us finding peace in our lives. It's about each of us finding not only happiness, but, but joy that is found in having the Holy Spirit reside in, within us. A Holy Spirit that provides comfort and guidance for each of us on a daily basis. And as we serve Christ, as, as we put Christ before ourselves, we serve God in a way that's not only pleasing to God, but in a way that says we hold on to our joy even though daily life doesn't exactly make us happy. And Paul also says that the world sees us holding joy in God. And that they will give us approval on a human level when they see that. And that may lead them to investigate a godly relationship themselves. And Paul wraps it up in a really straightforward way, I think. At least for me and for the readers of the, early, uh, of the letter in the early church at Rome. He says, do everything you can to bring peace to your life and into the lives of others. Let's stop there for a second. We live in a world today that the most important thing the world will tell you is that you need to have peace in your life, and if that causes friction in the lives of others, then so be it, right? 
Do everything you can to bring peace to your life and into the lives of others. Find ways that not only edify you, edify means to improve yourselves morally. Find ways to not only edify yourself, but also act in a way that those around you are also improved morally. Draw closer to God and show an improvement in your life in a moral way. But also act in a way that those people around you will grow toward Christ in a moral way. People are watching you. They want to see why you're different than everybody else. And here's the thing that I think we can apply in all sorts of situations. Like I said, Paul's talking about food here, right? Eating and drinking. But we can insert hundreds of things into this. Paul says here in Romans, don't let disagreements about fill in the blank for yourself. Destroy the work of God. He says, don't let disagreements about what you can and cannot eat and what you can and cannot drink destroy God's work. And like I said, we can move that statement to 2022 and we can insert probably a thousand things into that. And I think God's telling us the same thing. Don't let disagreements over these things destroy what I'm trying to do everywhere. Because you may be right, but if it leads to friction and separations within the body of Christ, within the body of the church, then it can't remain. It has to be dealt with and put away. But I'm right. Paul says it doesn't matter. It's destroying my work by your insistence to make sure everyone knows you're right. But then Paul also warns believers, the readers, and us, when he talks about, again, he's addressing this, they're having this disagreement because there's this Jewish heritage, this Jewish background into this, right? And they're going, you can't eat that because... The Old Testament, you know, the Hebrew Scripture says you can't eat that. And other people are going, yeah, well, we don't worry about the Hebrew Scriptures anymore. We're looking at this and we can do whatever we want. And Paul here writes that even though you think it's okay, again, he's talking about what you eat, but insert the situation of your choice here. Even though you think it's okay, you need to consider how others especially new believers and those who are thinking about where they stand in their faith, need to think about when they see what you're doing, what's their reaction? And if you can see how they may see your actions differently than you feel about them, Paul says you need to stop. Even though you're right, even if you think it's okay, you need to stop because your actions are causing other people to stumble in their faith. And if that's happening, then you need to stop what you're doing so they don't stumble. Because you can have joy even though you're not happy. So here's the big difference between being happy and having joy, right? Because our joy can and should remain even in times when happiness is the furthest thing from our minds. And you may want a model of that. Pat, put that into real terms because we've been talking about all these different scriptures. Put, take that and put that in something I can see 
and maybe even in a way hold. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. He says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of, our, of faith. Watch this. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He writes... That Jesus looked at the cross and looked at the crucifixion, but chose obeying God because of the joy that was in front of him. The joy that was set before him. Jesus, fully God and fully human, stood aware of the greatest physical pain and public humiliation in the history of the world, then and now. And I'm guessing that he as a human being probably wasn't very happy at that time. In fact, you could read scripture where he goes into the garden. He says, God, if it be your will, take this off of me. But it's not written here that, that Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of, of, of faith, for the happiness set before him, he endured the cross. It doesn't say that. See, Jesus had the ability to see the joy that laid in front of him, even if it meant going through some physical, painful moments on this earth to get there. See, for Jesus, <clears throat> his joy was in God, not in what God could do for him. And there's a difference. Jesus was obedient, even an obedience to the even to the length of being obedient to the to suffering death on the cross. And he did that for the joy that was set before him. Jesus found joy in God, not in what God could do for him. And family, we need to continually work to find our joy in all situations. Because as believers and as part of God's family, that joy is there. And here's a huge truth. God's joy. We talk about our joy. God's joy is found in you. You bring God joy. Courtney read earlier in Nehemiah says the joy of the Lord is your strength. God finds joy in us. You give God joy. Do you think you always make him happy? See, that's the point, right? it's important that our joy is placed in God and we don't fall into the trap of believing that our joy in God only comes when he's doing what we want him to do. Our joy should be in God not in what God can do for us. And if you want proof of that just look to Jesus. For the joy that was set before him he endured the cross. For you. And on a night in a manger in Bethlehem, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Joy to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for all who are here. I, I ask a blessing upon those folks who could not be with us here today. Father, we just...
place our joy in you in good times and in bad. When things are going right and when, when things are going horribly wrong, we just find joy in you even when in an earthly way we're not happy. You, you never promised, God, that it would be all good. You never promised it would be all happy. What you promised us is that it would be worth it. Father, maybe as we ponder where joy and your joy comes into our lives today, maybe there's somebody who carries those burdens and, and, and they, they just need something in their life that, that just anchors them. The anchor you provide for us is the joy that you put in front of us that we know is coming, the joy that you have promised us. The joy that someday will be fulfilled as our faith is fulfilled. Father, if there's somebody in this room who's been thinking about church and relationship and God and we throw a bunch of words around, help them to know, Father, that, that it all starts with just reaching out to you and saying, I, I don't know how to fix this. Will you help me? I mean, you may, you're not going to help them immediately, but you are going to help them because you're going to bring joy into their lives. Maybe this morning for the very first time, somebody sees that joy in front of them. Maybe there's somebody who needs to rededicate themselves to you, or maybe there's somebody who needs to join officially in the fellowship of this church and this church family. Or maybe, Father, there's just somebody here who needs to just pray about something. In a moment, there are going to be people standing around this room and, and they're going to be available for people to go and pray with them. And they will pray for them. Father, whatever you're calling on our hearts to do today, I just ask that you would give us the, the bravery and the strength and the power to answer that call. Father, we love you. And we ask these things in the name of your Son and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask members of our uh, prayer team to stand. Doug's over there. Mike's back there. Uh, Melissa handing off. Uh, Bo is back there. Um, if uh, uh, I'll be down here. If, if you need to pray about something, uh, just uh, let that ease your burden today. Let's all stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. is
thank you all for being here today. It's kind of a rainy day out there, right? Um, but uh, we appreciate you being here. Like I so said, we're going to have a, a business meeting uh, in the Red Room. If you can stay for that, uh, we have a couple of kind of big things to, to talk over. Um, but um, uh, as, as we say a lot, uh, there are a lot of people in this room you don't know their names. Don't leave here until you do. And uh, as always, give some hugs and some handshakes and let them know that you're glad that they're here. I'm going to ask Mike Edwards if he closes in a word of prayer this morning. Amen. Let's sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. good week.